Italy as a country did not exist until 1861. From the fall of Rome until the unification of Italy, the Italians were ruled mostly by foreigners who cared very little for Italy itself. Before unification, they were ruled by the Germans, the Austrians, the Franks, the French, the Spanish, the Popes, and even the Vikings. The Italians used to rule the Mediterranean, but before unification, they couldn't even rule themselves. And in this video, you will learn how Italy will be united. It started as soon as the Roman Empire collapsed, when all of Italy was taken over by the Ostrogothic Kingdom. But in 535 the Byzantine Empire tried to take Italy, but they failed and Italy was then split in two. For an entire millennium, 1000 years, Italy remained divided. They were ruled over by the Franks and the Holy Roman Empire until Italy became a collection of city-states during the Renaissance. And these city-states were often at war with one another. In order to win those wars, they would find allies outside of Italy to support them. And so Italy was fought over by Austria, Spain, the Holy Roman Empire and France for centuries. And this is the state we find Italy in before unification. Chapter 1 Republicans the year is 1796. Italy was ruled by 11 countries. Let's go over them one by one and get an understanding of Italy at the time. Many of these countries will change their names over time. To not confuse anyone, we will use the name they had right before they became part of modern day Italy. For example, the first country we will talk about is the Kingdom of Naples, which later became the Kingdom of Two Sicilies. Ruling both the island of Sicily as well as the southern part of Italy. They were the strongest country in Italy at the time, with a large agriculture to provide food, the largest population, and a powerful army. Its kings were members of both the French royal family as well as the Austrian royal family. Just for context, Austria and France were two of the most powerful empires at the time. As a result, it was friendly with both countries and was relatively independent. After all, if the French invaded, they could ask Austria for help, and if Austria invaded, they could ask France for help. And if an outsider invaded, they could ask both Austria and France for help. The second country is the Papacy, ruled by the Pope. They were not an impressive country in terms of military or economy, but the Pope was the ruler of Christendom and could call upon the Christian nations of Europe to support his cause. Then there were the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, the Duchy of Parma and the Duchy of Modena. They were officially all separate countries, however they were ruled by members of the Austrian royal family, meaning that they were essentially Austrian puppet states. Then there was the Republic of Venice. It was by far one of the weakest countries in Italy. They had spent a century losing wars and by 1796 they were essentially an Austrian puppet state as well. And then there was Austria itself. By the late 18th century, it seemed like Italy was about to be colonized by Austria. In the north, we can already see a few territories taken over, and it was expected that Austria would just keep going until even the independent countries would bow down to Austrian rule. Then there were the republics of Genoa and Lucca. There is not much to say about them. By the late 18th century, both countries were very weak. Genoa was essentially a French puppet state and Lucca an Austrian puppet state. Then there is San Marino, which was independent and remains so until today. And then there is the last country to talk about, the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. They were largely independent, although leaning heavily towards France. They weren't the most powerful country at the time and focused largely on industry. You might have seen images of modern day Italy where the north is rich and industrialized while the south is poor. Some of that started with Piedmont Sardinia that slowly created a powerful economy. And these are all the major players in Italy in 1796. And in that year, Italy took its first steps towards unification with Napoleon. Napoleon was a general at the time and was sent to Italy to fight against Austria and its allies. To the surprise of everyone, Napoleon kicked Austrian ass. And for the next 20 years, Napoleon would become Emperor of France and fight with Austria for control over Italy. France, under the rule of Napoleon, was a republic, meaning they didn't have a king or a queen who were rulers because their parents was a king or a queen. Instead, leaders would need to have a good reason to rule the country. When France went to war in Italy, they abolished the systems of kings and queens they had and installed new republican governments. 
In the Northwest, they created puppet states with Republican governments. In the Northeast, they created the Kingdom of Italy with Napoleon as its king. In the South, they created the Kingdom of Naples, ruled by the brother of Napoleon. And almost everywhere, the old feudal systems of lords and kings was replaced with a Republican system. And the Republican system was based on the French system, which was one of the most efficient forms of government at the time. For example, before the French Revolution, the nobility was largely above the law, but with the new French system, it became illegal to break the law. A second example, the governments had a more centralized government where all resources of the nation could be efficiently allocated to various projects. So if, for example, the government wanted to create a system of roads to improve trade, then that government had the resources and workers available to do so, instead of a bunch of lords each making their own roads on their own land without thinking about the nation as a whole. And a lot of people liked this efficiency. Many people in Italy wanted their republic and they began calling themselves Republicans. And just to address the red elephant in the room, I am not talking about the US Republican Party. When I say Republican, I just mean people who want their country to be a republic, not whatever weird things are happening in the US Republican Party. And these Italian Republicans really liked the fact that they no longer had a king or queen and that their government had to listen to the people for once. But anyone who listened to ABBA knows that Napoleon lost at Waterloo. France became a monarchy once again, and the Italian republics lost their biggest supporter. Without France protecting them, they were too weak to stand up to the other powerful countries like Austria. And so Austria invaded Italy. By the end of 1814, France was kicked out of Italy, the Italian republics were destroyed, and the old system from before the war was reinstated. The map went from looking like this in 1796 to this in 18. 1810 to this in 1814. The only major changes to the maps are that the Republic of Genoa is part of Piedmont Sardinia and Trent is now officially part of Austria. As though Napoleon never happened and republicanism never existed like it did in Italy. So imagine you're an Italian Republican and the Austrian government has just installed a monarchy in your area. You are probably very angry about this. And what do angry political groups do when they don't get what they want? They become more outspoken in their beliefs. They radicalize and they form secret societies. And the Italians were no different. Almost every city in Italy formed a secret society of republicans whose goal was to overthrow the government to create a new republic. And the republicans believed that the reason Austria could just walk into Italy and tell them how to govern themselves was because Italy was weak and divided. And they concluded that if Italy wanted to become independent, they had to become strong and stable. And to be strong and stable, they would have to join together in a single nation. They were convinced that to be free, Italy should be united. Chapter 2 Culture But after centuries of foreigners ruling Italy, there didn't really exist any Italian culture anymore that could unite Italy. Instead, the Italians adopted the culture of their foreign rulers. In the Austria regions, the people adopted more Austrian traditions, while on the border with France, they started wearing French fashion. They didn't even have a single language anymore. Instead, every region had their own dialect influenced by whoever had conquered them. Italy had no culture and no language of its own. But if Italy was to become united, this needed to change. If Italy was to be a single nation, it had to have a single culture and a single language all Italians could speak. And this new culture was created through art. Instead of French literature, Austrian opera, or regional music, the Italian artists started creating Italian literature, Italian opera, Italian music. This actually made those artists quite a lot of money, because instead of selling their work in their own region, they could now sell their works all over Italy, and the Italian nationalists and republicans would gladly pay money for art which represented their political views, such as the opera Ernani, written by Giuseppe Verdi. It's about three men who get into a relationship with one woman at different times of her life, drawing a similarity with Italy which had three empires ruling over it at some point, Spain, France and Austria. If you want to sell a book to Italians, they need to be able to understand that book. 
But as I said earlier, Italy didn't have a single language anymore. It was hard to write a book in your regional language in the north in Milan and then sell it to someone all the way down south in Sicily when they speak completely different dialects. You probably know of some English speaking countries whose version of English you find hard to understand. Hey, I've lived in Scotland. Once me and my friends had to ask a bus driver five times for directions. And in the end, none of us understood a single word he was saying because he spoke some obscure Scottish dialect. Now imagine trying to form a country with people you can barely speak to. The artists realized they couldn't sell tickets to the theater if nobody understood the performers. So they went about creating a single unified Italian language that anyone could understand. They would take the common words and rules of all the dialects and mix them together to form a new Italian dialect. A dialect almost anyone from Italy could understand. And if every author or playwright or musician used this language, then they could sell their products across Italy while also spreading the ideals of unification. The Italian language was created by artists to spread the idea of an Italian nation through their art. And this art took a lot of inspiration from religion. Italy was a very Christian region. In fact, some people literally had the Pope as their ruler. So artists took inspiration from the Bible to create Italian art, such as taking inspiration from the story of Moses, who, according to Christian mythology, saved the Jews from slavery and led them to the promised land. And these artists represented Italy as a people who were slaves to foreign powers, and that a united Italy was a mythical promise land, that it was the destiny of all Italians to rise up against their foreign rulers, kick them back to their own country, and create a homeland for themselves. And it also took inspiration from the story of Jesus, who, according to the Bible, was dead for three days, resurrected back to life, and then ascended into heaven. Italians saw the Roman Empire of the past as the glory days, and Italy died when the empire fell. Now it was time for Italy to be resurrected by uniting the people. In fact, the Italian word for Italian unification is risorgimento, which translates roughly to to rise again or to stand up again, meaning the revival of Italy as a country that is able to stand up for itself. Basically, the Italians wanted to make Italy great again, and the idea of a new Italian state spread across Italy in the 19th century. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing some sign for unification. And because religion and unification became so interlinked, it was impossible for governments to do a lot about it. After all, if you have a story about resurrection in Italy, you could just as easily claim that it's about Jesus and not about Italy. And so Italy started forming a new culture based on a united hatred for outsiders telling them what to do. Some of the art leaned so heavily on the idea of Italian unity that it was essentially Italian propaganda. A good example is an opera called Nabucco, which you're listening to right now. It was composed by Verdi and talks about the Jewish people who were invaded, conquered, and exiled from their homeland by the Babylonians. It draws a connection between the ancient Jews and 19th century Italians, who, after being invaded and conquered, needed to create a new country of their own. Chapter 3 The First Attempt Slowly over time, the cultures of Italy became more in favor of unification. The people in favor of unification were called Italian nationalists, because they wanted an Italian nation. And they organized protests, resistance groups, and revolutions. But the governments of Italy always crushed them and arrested their leaders. But beating up protesters doesn't actually solve any of the issues they are protesting about. And the biggest of these revolutions came in 1848. In this year, revolutions spread across Europe. You might remember the Arab Spring in 2011 with mass protests erupting in North Africa and the Middle East. Well, Europe had something similar in 1848. And in Italy, people had a lot to protest about. It started on January 5th as a strike in Lombardy, one of the regions controlled by Austria. The people stopped buying cigars and lottery tickets because both businesses were owned by the Austrian government, basically living a healthier life to stick it to the Austrians. By March, the city of Milan was in full revolt. 
all the way south on the island of Sicily, a revolt was so successful they declared independence until their defeat a year later. In February, Tuscany revolted. Seeing all these revolts, the king of Sardinia decided this was the perfect moment to join the revolutions to create an Italian republic. But Austria and France weren't just going to give up Italy so easily, so they sent in armies and took back control. The first attempt at Italian unification failed, but the revolutionaries learned a lot of valuable lessons. Firstly, Italian unification was very popular all across Italy. In fact, they were so popular that the current national anthem was written right before these protests started. The anthem is seen as a manifestation of the Italian desire to rule themselves. And this desire to rule themselves was successful until the Austrian army crushed them. For example, the Pope even had to flee Rome. The revolutionaries created a new country called the Roman Republic. Austria at the time was busy with their own revolt in Hungary and just couldn't help the Pope. So instead France sent their own forces, conquered Rome and reinstalled the Pope. And to make sure nobody ever threatened the Pope ever again, they kept a French army in Rome just in case someone tried something. Or take the example of Tuscany, where the king was first forced to accept a new constitution and was eventually driven from his country. Only later, with the help of the Austrian army, did they get their land back. The revolutionaries learned valuable lessons that they would use in a second attempt to create a united Italy. Firstly, it was possible to kick out the rulers, but it was not possible to keep them out for long, unless Italy had their own allies. And secondly, if Italy becomes republican, then the monarchies of Europe will crush them, like they did with Rome. These lessons would be used by the revolutionaries to make sure that Italy will be united. Chapter 4 The Second Attempt The map of Italy looks the same as before. It's as though the 1848 revolution never took place. And we will now focus on one of these countries called the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. This country had focused the last couple of decades on improving its economy. It had an advanced agriculture, expanded its rail network, and opened trade with other countries. With this money, they invested in an efficient government with a powerful army. By the 1850s, the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia was small, but powerful powerful for its size. And with this power, the kingdom had something to offer other nations in exchange for an alliance. And an opportunity for such an alliance came in 1855. Russia went to war with the Ottoman Empire, Great Britain and France. And Piedmont Sardinia joined the war as an ally of France. The army of the kingdom sent was small, only 21,000 compared to the 300,000 the French sent. But their soldiers were very effective and this impressed the new French emperor. And from that moment forward, France was an ally of Piedmont Sardinia. In just one war, they had gained the one thing they needed to succeed, an ally that could stand up to Austria. The leadership of Piedmont Sardinia decided Italy will be united, and they were the ones who were going to make it happen. But they would need the approval of France. After all, if France won't support them, then another country will just crush the Italians again. The French Emperor loved the idea of kicking Austria out of Italy. As we saw earlier on the map, Austria still held the most territory in Italy. Austria and France had been fighting over Italy for decades. So if this alliance would help kick Austria out, then it would secure France's southern borders from an Austrian invasion. However, you can't just attack Austria without a good reason. So they came up with a plan. Piedmont Sardinia would attack Modena. Modena was an Austrian puppet state, so Austria would have to join the war to protect Modena. And then France would support Piedmont Sardinia. This plan worked, and they crushed the Austrian army. And in exchange, Piedmont Sardinia would allow France to take over Savoy and Nice. Today, they are part of France, but 150 years ago, they were part of Piedmont Sardinia and considered Italian. And it's at this time that they became French in exchange for allowing Italy to unify. And lastly, the French emperor was introduced to a woman named Virginia Uldoini. She was an Italian celebrity considered very beautiful for her time, and she entered into a romantic relationship with the emperor for about a year. Her job was to convince the emperor to support unification using whichever orifice would get the job done. 
And this plan worked almost perfectly. The French and Piedmont armies were commanded by generals who had proven themselves in combat. The Austrian army was commanded by people who had a prominent position within the Austrian royal family. And even though Austria had a larger army, competence beats inbreeding and Austria lost the war. Let's look at the map again. Lombardy was directly taken over by Piedmont Sardinia. Tuscany, Modena and Emilia were occupied. In essence, going from Austrian puppet states to Piedmont Sardinian puppet states. Northwest Italy was secured and Austria lost nearly all their influence in Italy. France and Piedmont Sardinia wanted to kick the Austrians out of Italy completely, but both sides were running out of supplies. And everybody knew there would be another war to decide who would rule Italy. Chapter 5 The South there were just five countries left in Italy, Piedmont Sardinia and their puppet states in the northwest, the Austrians in the northeast, the Papal States in the middle, San Marino and the Kingdom of Two Sicilies in the south. And as the title of this chapter suggests, we're going south to take a look at the Kingdom of Two Sicilies. Because they were the next target. It was the most powerful country in Italy at the time. It had the largest army, the largest economy and the largest population. But this large population was rebellious. And in order to prevent any rebellions, government had created a police state. As you may recall, in 1848 there were revolutions all over Europe, including the Kingdom of Two Sicilies. Right here on the island of Sicily there was a rebellion. The rebels declared Sicily independent, turning the Kingdom of Two Sicilies into the kingdom without Sicily. The king ordered his troops to break up protesters, dissolved parliament and ordered his navy to bombard protesters. In one of these bombings, the navy spent eight hours shooting at the city of Messina, giving the king the nickname King Bomb. And while King Bomb took back all of his territory, his tyranny gave those people even more reasons to rebel in the future. King Bomb died in 1859, handing over the throne to his son. But being the son of a tyrant doesn't make you popular. In fact, he was so unpopular that he couldn't trust his own army to stay loyal. So he relied on Swiss mercenaries, soldiers from Switzerland who would fight for money. But in that same year as he became king, Switzerland made it illegal for any citizen to fight in foreign armies, except for the Pope's Swiss Guard. All of a sudden, the most loyal soldiers of the Kingdom of Two Sicilies returned home, leaving the king with an army he couldn't trust and a population ready to rebel again. This was the perfect opportunity to invade. But the Kingdom of Two Sicilies was too powerful to invade alone, so they needed to look for powerful allies and once again turned to France and Great Britain. France had helped them in the past to kick Austria out of Italy, but Austria had been defeated. So France gave their blessing, but they didn't want to help. So they looked for help from Great Britain. And the British were very interested because they were building the Suez Canal in Egypt, which was a colony of Britain at the time. The Suez Canal made transport between Europe and Asia faster, cheaper and easier because you no longer needed to sail around Africa anymore. It made transport so easy that other countries might try to take the canal for themselves. And if someone came to take the canal, then Great Britain would need troops close to the Suez Canal to prevent others from taking it and Italy was located close to Egypt and so the British made a deal. British warships will be allowed to dock in Italian ports in case we ever need to defend the Suez Canal. In exchange the British would give financial support for the war. This wasn't the help they hoped for but it was the help that they needed. It was time for the invasion to begin. Just one small problem. Piedmont Sardinia didn't have any soldiers for such an invasion. They were all busy keeping the newly conquered territories under control. And so Piedmont Sardinia sent a man called Giuseppe Garibaldi to conquer southern Italy. Garibaldi was considered to be one of the best generals of his time and his life alone deserves its own TV show. He joined a failed coup and was exiled from Italy in 1833. He fled to Brazil where he fought in a civil war and learned guerrilla warfare. He then hired Italian volunteers and taught them also how to fight guerrilla wars. And he won numerous battles using these tactics. In 1848, during all those European revolutions, he fought for Rome where he defeated a professional French army, showing that his guerrilla tactics worked very well in Europe 
where generals tended to fight more straightforward battles. After the revolutions were lost, he joined Piedmont Sardinia in their war against Austria. He was promoted to general, but given no troops to actually fight the Austrians with. So, he used his status as a famous commander and recruited volunteers and began fighting Austria in the mountains. He was so successful that he won victory after victory, even when he was outnumbered 2 to 1. He was perfect for the job of conquering southern Italy. Italy. As always, he recruited volunteers, about 1,000 of them, and together they would conquer southern Italy, or at least that's the official story. In reality, the British sent spies to the local commanders, offered them money if they just wouldn't fight. These commanders had a choice. They could either fight the famous general Giuseppe Garibaldi, or they could take the money, surrender immediately, and watch Garibaldi get rid of the unpopular king. As you can imagine, almost every commander took the money. Who wouldn't want to get paid to do nothing? And so Garibaldi would pick a fight, the commander would surrender, and the people would think that he won an amazing victory. Then he'd go to another army and do the same thing again. With every victory, he became more popular, and with more popularity, there were more people joining his army. In just three weeks, he conquered Sicily for Piedmont Sardinia. He conquered the island faster than it takes me to make a history scope video. But while the island was easy to take over, the mainland was a lot harder. Because the king resided on this mainland and he kept his strongest troops close to him. Look at this map. This is a map of Sicily on the left and the mainland on the right. And right here is a narrow strip of water that Garibaldi would have to use to move his army onto the mainland. He lacked a navy to transport his troops to another part of Italy, and this meant that they would instead have to send an army from the north. But if we look there, we see that this army would have to march through the Pope's territory, and the Pope was having none of that. His own people were already protesting. Letting a foreign army march through a rebellious territory might mean those people will join Piedmont Sardinia against the Pope instead. Plus, if they won the war, the Pope would be surrounded on all sides by Piedmont Sardinia. The Pope might be a predator, but he had no interest in becoming the prey. And so Piedmont Sardinia once again asked for help. As you might recall, in the 1848 revolutions, the Pope was kicked out of Rome and the city created the Roman Republic. When the revolutions were done, France left their army in Rome to defend the Pope. So Piedmont Sardinia asked France to help negotiate with the Pope to let them march their army south. And eventually they came to an agreement. Rome would hand over the rebellious territories to Piedmont Sardinia and in exchange all property owned by the church would remain unharmed. This was a great deal for both sides. The Pope lost rebellious territories, secured their profitable properties and Piedmont Sardinia gained a bunch of people who liked their new king a lot more than the Pope. And Italy promised to never touch Rome. The city of Rome would never become part of a united Italy. Rome was the property of the Pope and Italy would never change that. Piedmont Sardinia invaded from the north and within a couple of months they occupied the entire country. The king fled to Rome and later between Bavaria, Austria-Hungary and France to petition their leaders to send an army to Italy to restore him to the throne. But nobody did and he died in exile. In December of 2020, the Pope proclaimed him a servant of God. Just in case you're wondering whether the Vatican is still bitter about losing their territory. The answer is yes. Chapter 6 Creating Italy So now we're just left with the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia, the Papacy, San Marino and Austria. With all this new territory, the King of Piedmont Sardinia made a very important decision. Italy will be created. And so he called together the parliament, with representatives elected from every region, including the puppet states that were technically separate countries. Together with the Senate, they proclaimed that King Victor Emmanuel II of Piedmont Sardinia would now become King Victor Emmanuel II of Italy in 1861. The puppet states were officially disbanded and became regions within the Kingdom of Italy. 
But despite being the king of Italy, he did not rule over all of Italy. In the northwest, Austria still had a large part of Italy under their control. And in this video, we've spoken a lot about how Austria tried to control and colonize Italy before unification happened. But the Austrians were doing something similar in modern day Germany. The rulers of the Austrian Empire spoke German and had a German culture. And at the time, Germany itself was comprised of dozens of small states. Austria was the largest German speaking state and as a result came to rule the other German states for centuries. But this changed in the 19th century when the country of Prussia became just as powerful as Austria while also being a German nation. And in 1866 the two sides went to war. And this is where Italy comes in. Prussia and Italy were both rivals with Austria, so why not form an alliance? Prussia would get Germany and Italy would get Italy. And this is where things get a little bit complicated. Because Austria was afraid that more countries would join the war against them, so they made a deal with France. The city of Venice, located right here, would be handed over to France. In exchange, the French would stay out of the war. But France had no interest in Venice. But they still accepted the deal. Then France went to Italy and said, we are willing to give you Venice. In exchange, you keep your promise to let us keep Nice and Savoy. Earlier in the video, France had received these lands from Italy. But now that Italy was a large country, France wanted to make sure that Italy wouldn't break their promise and take back this territory. And so the war began on June 20th, 1866. Two months later, on August 12th, Austria surrendered. Almost all the Austrian territories in the region of Italy were handed over to the Kingdom of Italy. Italy had almost been united. Chapter 7. Italy will be united. So now we're just left with the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia, a little bit of Austria, San Marino and the Papacy. The Pope had ruled Rome for over a thousand years. According to Christian mythology, the Pope is the personal representative of the Christian God here on earth. The Pope at the time was Pope Pius IX, and a fun fact about him is that he is the first Pope to ever be photographed, as you can see on screen right now. The Pope was not just the leader of a country, he was the leader of a religion. In Rome, religion was government, and government was religion. There was no separation of church and state. People didn't really have any rights, but those people did have eyes and they saw democracies, civil rights and freedom right outside their border. To them, the Kingdom of Italy represented something better and so people began to protest. So what did the Pope do to end these protests? Well, I kid you not, he had all the cardinals come together and had them declare that the Pope was infallible. Which means that the Pope is incapable of making mistakes, that it was impossible for him to do anything wrong. You might have heard this before, that the Pope is infallible. Well, this literally came about because people were protesting against him. And he was so out of touch with reality that he told the protesters, you are wrong to protest me because I can't make any mistakes. Therefore, you have nothing to protest about. As you can imagine, this did not help the situation at all. In fact, protests just kept getting worse. But the Kingdom of Italy was afraid to invade Rome directly. Directly. Because the Pope is the leader of the Roman Catholic faith, you could expect a Catholic nation to come to the defense of the Pope. But then, 1870 happened. In that year, everybody was too busy to help. This is a very special year in European history. It's the year the Germans went to war with France. And in this war, the Germans were so successful, they occupied Paris, the capital of France. In fact, France lost so much that they had to recall the soldiers they put in Rome. You know, those soldiers from earlier in the video, France put there to make sure nobody could invade Rome. This was terrible news for the French, but it was great news for Italy because it meant that Germany and France were too busy with each other to defend Rome. At the same time, Austria's defeat at the hands of the Italians, as well as some other wars, almost caused the collapse of the Austrian Empire. They were now reforming into the Austro-Hungarian Empire and they were in no shape to fight any war with Italy. Spain had lost most of their empire and didn't have the resources to help the Pope. Russia and Great Britain had abandoned Catholicism centuries ago. 
and everybody else was too weak to fight Italy. There was nobody to call for help. The Pope was alone. This was the perfect time to invade Rome. At first, Italy tried peaceful ways of getting the city and the surrounding lands. When the French army left, Italy offered their own army to protect Rome. But the Pope wasn't stupid and refused. Then Italy declared Rome as their capital city and just marched their army towards it. They moved slowly, hoping that the Pope would simply surrender once he heard the thousands upon thousands of troops marching on his city. Instead, the Pope called on Catholics everywhere to come defend the city of Rome. People from all over Europe came to defend the Pope. In total, Rome had an army of 13,000 soldiers and volunteers. Here is a picture of them getting blessed by the Pope. Although interestingly, only 200 of them were from Rome itself. Most people were still protesting the Pope. Italy sent an army of 50,000 professional soldiers. The battle began at 6 in the morning. The Italians blew a hole in the city walls. You can actually see a picture from 1870 on screen right now that shows the hole in the wall. And by the afternoon, the Pope had surrendered. The Italians allowed him to live in Vatican City, located inside Rome itself. People were allowed to come and go to the Vatican as they pleased, and the Pope would get to keep being the Pope. A great deal for someone who just lost an entire country. But the Pope instead pretended that he was a prisoner and refused to accept Italian rule over Rome. This matter was not resolved until 1929, when the current relationship between Italy and the Vatican was established. But Rome was now the capital of Italy and the government moved into the city. And by the way, this Pope, Pius IX, was also beautified, the first step towards becoming a saint. I am not sure, but from the research I've done, it seems like all the Popes are still bitter about losing their territory to Italy, so they will make any person who opposed Italy into a religious icon. Chapter 8 The Last Pieces Italy was now ruled by the Kingdom of Italy, Vatican City, a little bit of Austria in the north, and San Marino. And let's talk about San Marino and why it wasn't conquered by Italy, unlike the rest of uh, Italy. So why does San Marino still exist? Well, during the struggle for unification, San Marino offered asylum to revolutionaries, among them Giuseppe Garibaldi. After Italy had been united, San Marino and Italy signed a series of treaties that kept San Marino independent. By providing protection to the revolutionaries, those same revolutionaries provided protection to San Marino. But Italy still had a long way to go to becoming a single unified country. Italy built statues to commemorate the Italians who fought for unity, created cultural exhibitions to showcase a single Italian culture, and created schools to teach a single unified Italian language. The layouts of entire cities were changed so that the people would naturally walk along streets and squares named after unification heroes. If you've ever been to Italy and found yourself walking along a lot of statues, walking towards important Italian monuments or noticed a lot of revolutionary art, that's not just because you're a tourist. It was created to remind Italians that they are Italian, not Milanese or Sicilian or Venetian, but Italian. Now, there is just one piece left all the way to the north, still controlled by Austria-Hungary, the successor state of Austria. Italy would have to wait until World War I to get it back. They joined the war on the side of the Allies, but at the end of the war the Austro-Hungarian Empire was breaking apart. All over their empire, regions were declaring their independence. With the empire breaking apart, Italy could simply move in to secure the last piece of Italy. And by 1918, all of Italy was finally ruled by Italians. Italy had been united. <laughs> <laughs> 